This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you by BitRefill. BitRefill is the best way to spend your crypto in Latin America. Purchase gift cards or mobile refills from more than 3,500 brands in 186 countries instantly, safely, and privately. Visit bitrefill.com for more information. Welcome back to the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today, we have a special episode, the highly anticipated Argentina Roundtable. We have six esteemed Argentina enthusiasts here with us tonight. So a lot of Argentina knowledge, very timely as well, obviously, Malay having having just been elected around a week ago. But with us today, and I'm going to introduce you guys all individually, just kind of do a quick hi, maybe introduce yourselves. Um, I guess I'll go starting top left. We have Mr. Martin Johnson. What's going on? Live from Buenos Aires. I am in Buenos Aires. Cool. We have Luke as well. Don't Make me butcher your last name. So Luke, hit us with an intro. Yeah, uh, my name is Luke Mikic. Uh, I escaped Australia in 2022 and now I've been living in Latin America for the past 24 months, just trying to travel to as many countries as some of you lads. Excellent. We got Mr. Joe DeJenny as well, a previous podcast guest. What's up? I'm going uh, to be more friendly on this podcast uh, <laughs> the last one. Joe Jenny here. I've been in Latin America. I think I'm going on eight years, uh, mostly living here, um, between here and the U.S. And I live next to a busy street now, so if you hear a little honking, that's that's me. The Latin jammer. We needed that. Instagram. We needed that. Martin Johnson, I forgot to mention, is also a previous podcast guest. And then next up, we have uh, James Nuveen, also a previous podcast guest, Twitter friend. James, what's up? What's up, guys? Yeah, I'm James. Um, been down here in Latin America for a little bit more than two years. Uh, spent only about two months in Argentina, but love that time. Spend most of my time in Colombia. Mm -hmm. But it was recent, too. So you were tweeting about it and stuff. So I was like, you know what? I'll throw this guy an invite. <laughs> yeah, that was that was about six months ago. So a, a pretty recent stay was it? in Buenos Aires. Yeah. Ah, oh, shit, it was six months ago? I thought <laughs> that was more reason than that. Anyway, good enough, you're here. <laughs> cool. And um, perhaps most importantly, or at least most famous as the Argentina guy, we have Mr. Bowtide Mara. Hello there, guys. Nice to be on. Thanks Previous for having me. Previous podcast guest as well. And then uh, recent addition invited by Mr. Bowtide Mara, Bowtide Leviathan, Apparently, Argentine has been outed. <laughs> hey, what's up, guys? So I'm a Argentine living in the States uh, right now. I've been here for six months, but, you know, 99.9% .9 of my life was in Buenos Aires. So I think I can say a thing or two. I was also part of the political mm. movement that right now. Uh, ended up in Milay being the president, so I may have uh, good. A thing or two to good about opinions are process. good, and it's good to have Argentine to kind of balance out all of the uh, the gringo Argentina enthusiasts. <laughs> awesome. So with the uh, the intros out of the way, I guess let's jump right into it. This is an audio only podcast, so people will have to kind of follow the voices a little bit. But luckily, lots of kind of different accents and, and voices here so honestly it shouldn't be too hard if you can distinguish martin from james uh after that everyone else kind of has like a pretty unique voice i feel so <laughs> so we should be good to go let's kick things off with uh mr bowtie mara probably like the number one argentina guy on on twitter practically or gringo latam twitter whatever you want to call it so happy to have you here how's um, life yeah, life is good. It's uh, it's every single day. I uh, basically can publish that meme, uh, que linda mañana, que hermosa mañana, because that's basically what it feels like. Uh, I mean, of course, nothing changed yet, and it's still like a complete shit show in terms of, um, you know, the uh, big 
explosive uh, hyperinflationary bomb that this uh, government is leaving the next administration or uh, Millet's government uh, who will only start from December 10th. Uh, mm. But, you know, just the idea of that shift to a more, you know, uh, open economy or the mindset, of course, we need to see how it works in practice. But uh, that is already a very positive thing. I mean, it's it's something that I personally did not expect at all. I, I thought, you know, with the whole state apparatus, China uh, uh, pitching in, Brazil helping out, I was just like, yeah, I mean, Mas is going to win. You know, it's like almost impossible to win this election just because of, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the amount of money involved is just nuts. And if you see like the uh, inflation that, this uh, whole campaigning of uh, Massa has has generated additionally of what was already very inflationary. It's seriously, you know, almost uh, ripe for treason. I would say it's it's really really bizarre. Like the levels uh, to which they uh, they went to try to fund the campaign with public funds, basically. Dude, there was literally like propaganda of massa absolutely everywhere every single billboard you've got posters of massa's face you know pasted on windows of shops all around the city it's unbelievable have, have you guys has anyone seen any advertisements for Millet in the city i saw some in my neighborhood but uh, they've all been torn off uh, and then afterwards they were pasted over with uh, massa uh, adverts <laughs> It was basically at the start of the campaign, and then very quickly, it just all went away. And you really noticed that Millet had zero budget because every mm -hmm. weekend, you know, on every corner of the street, there were always like these stands from uh, the other parties. And there was never a stand for Millet, you know, handing out uh, flyers and whatever. Uh, so it was really like, you know, almost a, a native internet thing where uh, everybody just, uh, you know, started talking about Millet, but you didn't really have the on the ground uh, action going on that uh, character is so characteristic for all these uh, politicians, usually. Mark. So every every time a campaign is, is, is ongoing, you have to uh, declare how much money are you spending on that campaign? And that's public for everybody. Uh, Millet's statement says that he spent zero pesos with zero cents uh, on the campaign. So everything that you've seen, uh, either on social media or in the street, like people working, giving out like, papers and things like that, it was all volunteer and people using their own money just to, to finance everything. Mara, do you, do you... So it was basically a couple shit posters on Twitter and people who wanted to help against $16 billion in pesos spent plus money from China, plus money from Brazil uh, in, in, with ghost companies working on ads on the internet and just was monst monstrosity like, like Mara. Mara and Leviathan, do you guys see... Malay's election as being like the first domino in a whole series of dominoes, either in just Latin America or the world. Do you see that being like the first domino in a, in a big series of cataclysmic events? It, I mean, it, it has the potential to be uh, so far, like until anything happens, I think it's just uh, another, um, you know, a government voting out the sitting government during COVID, because basically what we've seen is every every single government that came out of COVID uh, was voted out. Basically, uh, it was all changes of government uh, all across the continent. Um, so, you know, it could be that or, you know, it could be really a more uh, uh, from the ground up kind of um, change, which I think is, is definitely happening with younger people. And and that could, you know, spread uh, over to other countries. Like, for example, in Chile, I, I'm pretty sure that they're kind of uh, done with uh, Boric's experiment of, uh, you know, semi-socialism there. Uh, I know that in Colombia, they're kind of tired. I'm not sure, like, you know, after the midterm uh, outcome, I don't think they're going to re-elect Petro there. Um, Lula, we'll have to see, um, you know, but with him, like, upping taxes, uh, deficit spending again, etc., 
Uh, I'm not sure if uh, unless we get a commodity bull market, which could happen, uh, they they will pull out. Um, but unless that happens, I'm not sure if, if he's going to have such a great presidency either. Uh, but he just started, so he still still has some time there to uh, to fix things. But yeah, and and Peru is basically you know a very unstable kind of situation that just uh, yeah I'm not even sure like how uh, what's going on right there uh, right now because it's uh, so chaotic. Paraguay always chill, you know, always right <laughs> more right wing. Uruguay always you know more neutral. Uh, but yeah, I mean, all eyes are on Malay uh, internationally. I'm I'm really surprised by the amount of media attention that he's getting, and uh, also media attention from like not only the bizarre Trumpian angle, but also more of like the libertarian side. I think that's really positive that they're highlighting, you know, the more anarcho-capitalist uh, side of Malay. Hmm. Yeah, you know what's interesting about Luke's story is. He's living both of the biggest stories right now in politics, right? He's got, he lives full time in El Salvador. So he's living the Bukele dream. And now he's spending time in Argentina and his timing is impeccable because he was here for the victory. Now he's chilling. And so he's seeing the, the Mille victory. So the, the Australian guy is just in the, at the right place at the right time. Yeah, I call Latin America my home now. Uh, I, I think going back to like James's question, uh, I, I think it's a really important point you raise. Like, I think the election of Millet is a huge domino. I think it's a huge signal. I, I think um, if you look pi- back over the past 250 years, I think we're on this bigger trend of more and more centralization. But I think this actually changed in 2016. So I think the election of Trump was a massive, you know, signal. People saying, hey, hang on a minute, I'm fucking sick of all this centralized power. Um, and then obviously you saw Brexit in the same year, 2016. You see the election of Bukele in El Salvador. And then uh, I, I think Millet is an absolutely huge domino that's kind of signaling, you know, the little guy's fed up. He's fed up with this centralized power. And I, I think for the first time since the 1770s with the American and the French Revolution, um, I hope uh, I, I hope we're beginning to see the signs of you know more of a decentralized revolution. So yeah, I, I, I'm I'm living amongst it in uh, Latin America because I think uh, you're going to want to avoid many of these Western uh, nations uh, in the next decade um, because you know as the sovereign individual book lays out, they're going to become increasingly tyrannical. Um, as they try to deal with the um, enormous amount of debt that they do have. So I, I'm pretty pumped to be living and spending my time between El Salvador and uh, Argentina and just trying to learn as much about the region from chaps like yourself. I think that we also have to understand what is happening in the countries uh, in, that, in which people like Millet or Bukele uh, are winning, Right. Because for a country to make the decision to put someone in power that's going to make so much of a radical change, uh, you have to understand the circumstances that that country was was going through, right? Uh, in, in El Salvador, was the the most dangerous country in America in the continent. Uh, people could not be walking on the street because they were risking their lives. Right, and it was so fucked up that somebody had to come and say, "Yo, I'm going to fix this," you know, and I, I, we have to do this on a radical way because there's no other way to fix it. So he won, right? In Argentina, uh, we have we are at risk of high, hyperinflation. We have been on four years on perpetual crisis. Uh, people have no prospect for a future, and we had governments that no matter on which side they, they would be on the spectrum, they demonstrated that were not up to the task. And the only thing they cared about was uh, to stay in power, you know, to keep uh, with their privileges and their shady businesses. And all, uh, all that situation made the Argentine people to basically be living in misery. Right, so when this crazy dude comes and starts talking on TV, insulting politicians on, on their faces, 
and explaining pe to people why are they getting poor, why uh, the politicians will never fix their problems and, and people are angry because they're living like shit, that can make somebody like Millet uh, a, a, a potential solution to that problems, and that's why people follow him, right? But you can take a country in Europe that people think they are living the life of the first world and they think that gender pronouns are the most important issue in their existence, right? It's it's more difficult for a person like Millet to, to, to have power over there, right? So Latin America is a very specific kind of place because all of us have been living under socialism most of our lives, right? With very specific exceptions, but people are just fed up with it. They're just Leviathan. I... And, and that also influences a lot. But I still agree that Millet, if he does well, could be a positive change, like the domino piece that... Uh, will bring more movements like him all around the continent and maybe hey, Le overseas. Leviathan and Mari you might have a good answer to this question too, because you've been there for so long. Obviously hyperinflation has been around in Argentina for a while. This isn't anything new to the Argentine people. Obviously it's, it's probably reached a climax now, but the Argentines have been living under hyperinflation and socialism and Peronism for a long time. What makes 2023 so special? Is it the charisma of Malay that kind of garnered all this support and all this like grassroots? Well, I think uh, it's like also because he's he's not part of the uh, what they call la casta, the, the political caste. He's really an outsider in terms of he's never been politically active uh, up until the moment that he decided to run for deputy, and uh, and and he got elected. Uh, and then one year later, he decided to run for president um, just to basically kick everybody out. That was uh, the phrase. Of course, uh, you know, many people just read that. OK, this is just, you know, more right wing populism because that's the way you win elections. But in his case, it was actually, you know, because politicians say things all the time and everybody knows it's kind of fake. But in his case, he because he came from outside as an economist and, you know, uh, people have seen him on TV for 10 plus years and he always said the same kind of things. Um, it's, it's more like, uh, you know, they're more likely to believe him. So, um, uh, I think that that is a, a big trust factor and, you know, we'll have to see how his, uh, his government turns out because, you know, there's so many roadblocks and potential issues that, uh, he has to, uh, overcome. Um, especially so socially, I think it, it will become like, uh, you know, quite uh, in interesting because uh, like you said, you know, it's the uh, country has been governed by Peronism for so long. They are really ingrained in every single layer of society uh, and in power structures. Um, this goes for unions, for, you know, social movements. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically, um, you know, with the, the flick of a switch, they can just decide to, okay, we're going to protest here. We're going to have these unions, uh, you know, stop uh, the whole logistical chain, et cetera, of the country. So they can really do a lot of damage that way. Um, now, the big question is, um, uh, will, will they be able to do that? And if, you know, the government starts uh, uh, acting uh, against that, and, and that, that's what I think there's, there is a danger. Like if they uh, react too violently on this, then it's going to become like fascism, you know, all those kind of things you're going to see in mainstream media. Uh, you know, if somebody gets killed in riots or whatever, you know, it's all going to be like the Bukele story uh, that we already know uh, in mainstream media. Uh, and then you see these, these kind of right wing guys and they crack down and they kill people. Uh, it's going to be that kind of story. So, I think they're definitely, definitely going to try to provoke. This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you by Language Blend, the new best way to learn Spanish. 
Language Blend focuses on what you actually need to live and get by abroad with daily one-on-one lessons, a dedicated texting partner. It's like living in a Spanish-speaking country without ever leaving home. Go to languageblend.com for more information. Broke that, and well, we'll, we'll see uh, like how they deal with it. So Argentina is a very particular case. Uh, first, let's talk about the James question, uh, why, why Millet managed to win. So in 2001, Argentina had his worst crisis in his entire history. We had a huge bank run, uh, what we call the Corralito. And uh, the, the it, there was a, a massive protest, people died. But the slogan of that protest was, we want everybody out, que se vayan todos, right? And what happened is that nobody left. The same people stayed. And they they, they keep doing the same things that caused the, the 2001 crisis in the first place. Millet came and said, okay, the reason those people you wanted out never left is because they are what he calls the casta politica, right? The, 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 the people who are there, they are... They, they, are in power, they are power, they have the institutions, they, they, they make their businesses there and they're never going to leave. You have to kick them out by putting different people in power. And I think that's something that resonated a lot because people never had an answer, a political answer to the issues they faced, it, right? If you wanted Bernism out, you would have to vote for an anti pernist But that anti pernist doesn't necessarily... Uh, uh, holds a political ideology that maybe that you may hold, right? But you have to vote Can for I ask him a question? because he's um, not for, right? for the so audience and have, honestly for myself as well, yeah. what is Peronism? What is a Peronist? As in, as easy as possible, like a 10-second so response. Yeah. So 1945 President Juan Domingo Perón uh, was the big uh, fascist populist government of the uh, of the south of South America. Uh, he basically invented this power structure of uh, socialism and welfare and things like that. And he was a huge uh, political phenomenon that uh, left a, a legacy that still mm. holds power to this day, right? So Peronism is the doctrine of government that follows Juan Domingo Perón's mm. ideals, basically. Uh, so you either have the Peronist party or you have the anti-Peronist party, which has a lot of names. Long time ago was the Radicals, and now with uh, Mauricio Macri, you had uh, Juntos por el Cambio or Pro, uh, and now... You had Millet, and and when Millet came, right, he, he came to say, okay, now you don't have to choose between a Peronist that you don't like and an anti-Peronist that the only thing he has going for him is that he's not mm. Peronist, but he can be a socialist too. Okay, just two he different degrees too, of socialism. Right? He, he's not going to solve your problem. He's only going to kick, Got yeah, it. he's only going to kick Peronists out for four years, but because he's... He's not going to fix the country. They are going to come back, right? Because he's going to fuck up too, right? So Millet was this alternative that would bring true change while kicking the Bernies Got out. It. Yeah, I do think it's uh, important to get a footnote there for, uh, for non-Argentines. Basically, Peronism can morph into anything it wants to. It, uh, <laughs> because... Uh, we've had left-wing Peronism. It started basically with very fascist kind of right-wing Peronism. That's the the core. It's based on Mussolini's uh, state model, which is basically the state ingrained with big companies uh, to you know rob what they can. Uh, actually, his whole labor law is based on the Carta de Laboro uh, from Mussolini. Um, he basically copied that to Spanish. Uh, he also, um, uh, you know, ran an internship uh, in the uh, Italian military during uh, Mussolini. Um, mm-hmm. So basically, that's the base. Then it morphed into um, a whole bunch of stuff. And then in the 90s, it became more 
uh, what they call here neoliberal, where they started privatizing everything. But Menem, he was also a Peronist, but he was, you know, completely different. And then from the 2000s onwards, they had a really bad taste in their mouths from the 90s of uh, the neoliberals, and they started uh, to become very more, much more left wing Marxist. Um, and, and that's been basically the past 20 years has been way more socialist and, you know, nationalizations. And, um, uh, so basically that's the, the, the stain that, that everybody remembers of Peronism, but a few people that today cheer for Peron, uh, actually, you know, know what the base is or, you know, don't have any connection to that. Yeah, but it were different times and they have all kinds of excuses for it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's 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 really uh, interesting. Like it's kind of a chameleon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a power structure. It's not a. It's not a. It's not an ideology. It's a power structure. They will do anything to stay in power, no matter if they have to be right wing. They'll be right wing if they have right. to be left wing. Can, can, can I stop right you, right Leviathan? I just don't but want things to be say, too but, like ideology, blah blah blah, left right. Let's let's try to keep things like really actionable for the audience. Yeah. Um, and I think it might be mm -hmm. a little bit more interesting that way for people sure. who don't really need all the nuance of Argentine politics. Um, so I'll hit you. I'll hit you with a, a, a question that uh, I guess anyone can can jump in on, but. What's up with dollarization? Are we going to dollarize? Is the peso staying? What are we? What are we doing here? What's we don't what's, know. Yet. I haven't like investigated all the speeches and stuff. What's what, what's it looking like? So to dollarize, we need dollars, and we currently do not have any. the The Federal Reserve reserves are completely empty. Um, so right now. Uh, Milei and his economic team uh, just came back from the United States be uh, looking for money. And mm -hmm. it looks like they got it. Uh, so in December 10th, he is going to uh, put in, into Congress uh, an omnibus, omnibus law. It's a law that has a lot of laws. In that law should be the dollarization project and it should start... Uh, taking effect after that. It's not going to be instantaneously. It's going to take at l maybe uh, 9 to 24 months, uh, depending on what happens, right? Because Argentina's economic volatility right. yeah, is so doesn't high. doesn't happen overnight. Predict one month in advance, let alone two years. Um, first, you have to do some uh, financial stuff. I don't know if you, if you want me to talk about it. It's kind of complex, something called the kicks. It's like some government bonds that have to be uh, paid before you can make any project of yeah. dollarization because that's like a hyperinflationary bond. But we think that if everything goes right, we should have dollarization by the end so of the You think it's going to happen? What do you think, our... Mara? You think they're going to dollarize? Mm, well, yeah, I think, I think it will take at least two years, maybe three years to get the books in order. And... Uh, and then we'll have to see if they uh, if they have the funds for it because you know, they do need a lot of billions to to dollarize. I mean, you know, people have dollars. There's like a huge amount of dollars, but those are private. Of course, the government can't use those. Um, so I think first things first, we'll see. You know, uh, taking care of the fiscal situation and then uh, really trying to uh, get rid of inflation as much as possible. And that will probably take two years. Uh, next year, we'll probably see 400, 500% inflation first before it gets lower. Uh, just because it's, you know, it's such an hyperinflationary bomb right now. It's set in, in stone that this will happen. Even, you know, if you would cut everything tomorrow, we'd still have like a lag of, you know, six to 12 months of very high inflation because it's mm -hmm. like a pressure cooker uh, because they had so many price controls, this fake uh, official dollar that many importers had access to. Um, all that stuff is going to go away. So basically that all those prices are going to explode. Um, so I, I think first we're going to get a lot higher inflation before it, it, it goes down. It's sort of like the same dynamics that, uh, we saw during the previous hyperinflation, which was a lot worse, uh, in, uh, 1989. Uh, I think we reached 5,000% at that point. So we're not there yet, but now uh, hopefully we don't get there. <laughs> Thousand. Yeah. So you guys are both 
saying that dollarization is going to happen. Obviously, it doesn't happen overnight. It's going to take a year or two to, to put in motion and work out deals and stuff like that. It would be the biggest country outside the United States using dollars. You know, there's Ecuador, there's El Salvador, there's Panama, there's Palau. And you guys really think it's going to happen? Well, it, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's like currency competition. Could, it's not yeah. that he wants to install dollarization. Okay, everybody needs to use dollars. It's more like, you know, you can use whatever you want to use. Uh, but the state will probably, since the dollars is what they use the most, they'll probably dollarize, but, uh, but not mandatory. Um, so Argentina has a huge relationship with the, lo- the dollar, the the um, Argentine people are obsessed with the dollar. So what Millet says is that, okay, we're just going to get rid of the peso but buying by buying those pesos with dollars, right? So people will have dollars in their hands, in their bank deposits and everything. After that happens, there is no legal tender anymore. You can use whatever currency you want. It can be dollars, can be euros, can be reales, can be bitcoin if you want to. Uh, it can be whatever you want. Uh, of course, 99.9% of people are going to use dollars, so it's like yeah, kind of de facto my, my idea of dollarization is like you it's have the to pay the legal tender dollars. that you, you know, pay your taxes with and yes, that you we get won't paid have your salary with. Maybe I have the wrong idea of what dollarization means. I know it could be kind of like a instrument level thing but like what are people actually going to get paid with and pay their taxes with do you guys think that that could be dollars a couple of years from now mm-hmm. yeah it, it's gonna be dollars but again it's it's not gonna be if some company feels like paying you in euros and you accept that contract they could do it we will not have a legal tender but again 99 percent of payments are going to be in dollars because people just just I feel like it'll be a similar situation. And Luke, you might have a perspective on this. It might be a similar situation to what is going on in El Salvador. Like what Bukele did was open the gates to whatever currency the people and companies wanted to use. They could use dollars, they could use Bitcoin. And I feel like that's kind of what Malay's plan is to de-dollarize or... To, to dollarize the economy, to give more so the option of using dollars or pesos or Bitcoin or whatever you want, more so than exclusively do, doing everything in dollars. Is that right? Yeah, I, I would say yeah, that's the idea uh, behind uh, Millet. Now, in practice, because you know, I've seen a lot of uh, people on Twitter, yeah, Bitcoin, whatever. In practice, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I want to ask Luke a question. Like you've been more on the ground in El Salvador. Like how many people actually use Bitcoin versus dollars? Yeah, so if I had to guesstimate uh, in the main city, it's probably about 5% of the population. That's my anecdotal kind of experience. If you look at the actual hard statistics on how many people are actually using the uh, Chivo wallet, which is the wallet that all of the merchants in El Salvador use to accept Bitcoin and convert that Bitcoin into dollars, a lot of the hard statistics kind of back that up. They say about 10% of all Salvadorians are still using this Chivo wallet. So they're accepting Bitcoin in like 2023. So this is a couple of years after the legal tender uh, announcement. Uh, so obviously adoption varies in the major city, probably about 5%. On Bitcoin Beach, uh, it's probably more like 20%, maybe 25% uh, yeah. of people actually accept Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, 5% is, is not bad. Um no, because I, I always hear uh, Bitcoiners when they go to El Salvador, uh, they uh, they kind of complain that the adoption is not there yet uh, in terms of what they they'd expect. Yeah, so many people like many people say, "Oh, Bitcoin's only at five percent adoption; it's failed." Uh, like I think the country's it's it's made some pretty big leaps and strides in only two years. It's gone from zero to five percent adoption, and like uh, like. It's really interesting because like sure, some shops don't accept Bitcoin, but most of those shops that don't accept Bitcoin, they're very, very technically inept. Like they're like El Salvador is a third world country. 
they don't even have computers. So it's natural for many of the stores to not accept Bitcoin. They don't even have a smartphone. But for example, I lived in El Salvador for six months straight. I tried to spend Bitcoin every single day. Uh, I spent Bitcoin on over 300 occasions. So every single major grocery store uh, accepted Bitcoin, uh, your pharmacies accepted Bitcoin, your major big like technology stores all accepted Bitcoin. So I think the country certainly come a long way. That's cool. Yeah. Hmm. So wouldn't dollarizing necessarily mean getting rid of the peso because all the countries like Ecuador and whatever that they used to have a different currency and then that currency had problems and then they got rid of it to use the dollar. Do you see a world where they're, they're using pesos and dollars at the same time or do you, is the idea? The peso is not, it's not going to exist anymore. So what what Mila is going to do is he's going to get dollars from whatever he finds them. Uh, probably he's going to issue more debt. He's going to buy every single uh, peso bill that's on the street, on your wallet, on your hand, under your mattress, whatever. He's going to buy them with dollars. So you're going to have an amount of dollars equal to that quantity of pesos, depending on the peso dollar exchange rate at, at the time. He's also going to buy every bank deposit and bonds or, or whatever, what we call encajes bancarios. Uh, after that's done, once there's not a single peso running around anymore, he's going to close the part of the central bank who's in charge of printing pesos, right? So pesos are not wow. going to exist anymore. They're gone. Mara, would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I think uh, that's the only way to... Uh to get rid of the uh, hyperinflation over time, because otherwise it will just uh, end up with the same uh, scenario. The thing is like to actually close the central bank, uh, that's gonna be a real challenge legally um, because it's kind of set in a part of the constitution uh, as well. Um, well, I mean, that's that's what a lot of constitutionalists differ, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean Yes, but you can just close. Yeah, the but then after Millet is gone, they can open it again. And that's, that's the that's the thing. Like it's then it's not fully closed because I you know the solution is there's this thing called peso oro, which is basically a uh, legal um, coin that is a peso pegged to a certain uh, gold uh, rate, and it's used in legal contracts, etc. It's it's a legal currency. Uh, nobody uses it, but uh, it's used by the government and uh, a way to sort of bypass uh, the legal obstacles is to just declare that the legal currency because the constitution says you have to have uh, a currency um, uh, that the central bank uh, has to provide uh, they could use that and then like cut off the normal peso uh, and then technically on paper argentina has its own currency but they wouldn't be printing anything so that's a solution uh, but then technically the next government could say, well, now we're going to install a printer again and we're going to do everything like we've always done. Even so, history has shown that it's extremely hard to come back from a dollarization, right? Because you say, okay, the next government can just come back and start yeah, picking pesos. Yeah. Nobody's going to touch them. Like. Right? It's it's politically impossible after, let's say that Millet eats some power for eight years. You have eight years of using the dollar and some dude comes here and says, I'm going to bring the peso back. Nobody's going to vote for him. And if he tries to do it, he's going to fail. Like You don't have the, the political power to do it. People would just not accept it because they know what, what's, what's going to happen, right? Uh, you have the case of um, Ecuador. They, they, sur they survive two defaults, two debt defaults, and the dollarization, it's still ongoing. And the presidential candidate that wanted to bring whatever the currency's name is back, he just fucking lost, right? So it, it's Levi, really difficult to come speaking back. Speaking of after. coming back, uh, do you yes. plan on going back to Argentina? Are you optimistic? Uh, not yet. Uh, I want to <laughs> come back with money, uh, right? Uh, that's what I left in the first place. Uh, 
and even if even that even so Millet won right but it, it's gonna be a while until Argentina starts you know going to the moon <laughs> again uh, he has to basically remake the entire institutional yeah. structure from scratch and that's gonna take a lot of time it's just not just it's not just the dollar it's not just inflation Argentina has it's rot it's rotten to its core and you have to change everything mm. uh, you have to get rid of a lot of regulations you have to get rid of a lot of taxes you have to do tax reforms uh, you have to uh, fix again all, as Mara said all the uh, fix, fiscal def government spending problems uh, and at after that's done, Argentina is going to start growing again. For the people that have money now, they can wait a little bit, and then they will have really big opportunities. Uh, for the people who are Argentine, who are living in Argentina, who have no means to get uh, any kind of capital that's not in pesos, and even then it's just really little money, no, they are not going to just be millionaires overnight, right? Uh, you still need capital. And, and the average Argentine, it's not going to make uh, more money than it's, what it's making now anytime soon. Like it's maybe go up a little bit, but it, again, it's going to take... Yeah, and beyond time. institutional change, there. let's be honest, there's a bit of a social yeah. element. Like There would need to be social change yes. going on in this country yeah. as well, uh, if we're being yes, honest. Social. Yeah, cultural change. Um, cultural yeah, change, exactly. Yeah, that's very important. I, I would say the midterms in 2025, that is like a key moment. If uh, if Millet can uh, yes. you know, get more seats in uh, Congress uh, and during those elections, that would be the best case scenario. Because then right now, even with the uh, alliance with uh, Macri's party, they don't have enough seats to really uh, get a majority. Um, well, I mean that they every do. everybody uh, except yes. the fairness have to work together. Um, you know, it's really a couple seats. So what happens now because of the way uh, the seats in Congress and Senate uh, get uh, changed in elections? Even though Milei came first, he only has ten percent of seats in Congress, uh, so he has to negotiate a lot uh, with the guys who came in, in third place, which is uh, Mauricio Macri's uh, party, Juntos por el Cambio. Uh, that could slow down slow down a lot of the radical reforms that Milei wants to make because uh, this uh, Mauricio Macri's party is kind of a center, center right, sometimes center left, depending on depending on the day. So, again, the, it's not guaranteed that Argentina is going to become this anarcho-capitalist country overnight. Uh, because even though Millet won, he still doesn't have a power structure strong enough okay. to do everything on his own, right? He, he needs the consensus from a lot of people that may, know, may not want to lose privileges and, and all, all those things so again we have to see what happens after december 10th we have to see how this omnibus law that he wants to pass goes what does that mean accepted, omnibus. if he gets rejected if uh, omnibus law is a law <laughs> that has a lot of laws yeah it's basically a package like a like bus filled with laws that law. he files all at once okay yeah. uh, exactly as maybe some of those laws are passed, some of those laws are not passed. Maybe they change how some of them work, right? We know that in that omnibus law, we're going to have the reform of the state. So that's going to be like huge cut on public spending. We are going to have a lot of, uh, the, we are going to get rid of a lot of regulations uh, surrounding uh, mm -hmm. commerce and markets. Uh, and after that, they will have to, again, work on being a, on, a, on a fiscal surplus. After that, they have to get rid of the CEPO Cambiado, which is the restriction to buy foreign currency. Uh, after that, they have to make the tax reform. 
After that, they have to make the labor reform. Uh, after that, they have to dollarize. Again, and that's going to take years, maybe even more than one uh, mandate, right? Uh, what what Millet calls first generation reforms and second mm, generation reforms. sounds like a, a tall order. We just don't know. Uh, it, again, Argentina, it's not a place when you can think long term. Like every day, something can happen. Like literally yesterday, in the, like at nine in the night, Sergio Massa, the current minister of economics who, who ran from, from pressing against Millet, uh, he just did a really dick move uh, with the central bank, which could mean that after December 10th, we would have to print a half of a monetary base, which would, again, uh, cause a lot of more inflation. And that could change all the mathematics that Millet's team are making to you know, push the reforms, and that would change the planning. T- we just don't know. Uh, we also have another huge problem... Uh, in Argentina, we have something called the Aguinaldo. So basically, if you make, I don't know, a million pesos, um, 1.2 million pesos a year, instead of making 100,000 pesos a month, you would make a little bit less. And then they would give you like one of that part that they took from you uh, in the middle of the year and at the end of the year. And people think it's like an extra income, which is not. Well, they have to pay all of the Aguinaldos from the public sector and okay. they have no money. Lots of problems. I'm, I'm sure we could, you know, run so through, it would take hours out. to run through all yeah. the problems. It's a mess. Like it's a complete mess. Fix. So yes. maybe let's uh, keep the podcast moving. Get, <laughs> maybe try to get uh, Joe yeah. and Martin involved a little bit. Um, I was thinking maybe for a next topic, kind of going off the, the potential dollarization in, in two years. So do you think like right now is maybe like a, a cool little golden age where it's going to be very high inflation for two years. It's going to be cheap, but there's a lot of hope. And so it should be like, you know, pretty safe, pretty good vibes. And it'll be a great time for digital nomads to spend time in Argentina. And they're going to, you know, see a lot of cool changes going on. But, it, you know, before the dollarization and you know what I'm getting at. Actually, yeah. Go ahead, Martin. Uh, in the city... What we've oh, seen, what I'm seeing right now, personally, and you guys might know, like I don't, I don't really pay attention to Argentine politics or financial policy or anything, but I'm personally seeing prices increasing a lot right now, and the dollar is not getting stronger; it's actually getting weaker against the peso. So, I'd say my cost of living in the last two weeks is probably going up like twenty percent. Now it's still cheap. And I don't know if that's being art, like if that blue rate is being artificially tinkered with. It definitely was before the election, but I'm seeing prices rise right now. Personally, I don't know if that's going to continue. If that's going to change when Malay actually assumes office, but that's what I'm seeing. Mara, what do you th- what are your thoughts on this? You think because Mara is all about telling us about the ten dollars stakes on Twitter. So, <laughs> well. Uh... Yeah, I, th- I think it's uh, it's it's temporary. The thing is that um, the central bank started giving out this new instrument that everybody's buying, so there's a lot of uh, peso demand and less dollar demand. So uh, that's one of the reasons why the blue rate is going down and uh, your stakes are getting more expensive. Uh, but that that should end soon because uh, they're trying to stop uh, the central bank from doing that because that makes everything even more inflationary. Because technically, you know, it should be the blue rate should be way higher, um, and I, I think the the price levels will remain around these levels. It might become a little bit more expensive in dollar terms. I think what's ex- especially going to increase is uh, temporary rentals. Um, I've seen that uh, in the last couple of months. It's become a lot more expensive to rent uh, on Airbnb, et cetera. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, compared to last year uh, or a year and a half ago, uh, definitely. Uh, so, and- so tell me, do you think six months from now and one year from now, overall, Argentina is going to be cheaper or more expensive? Uh, more expensive to live in terms of paying rent. Um, more or less the same uh quality of life of going out uh, for dinner, uh, going out for beers, etc. I don't think that is going to change too much in dollar terms. But uh, I think the uh, t- furnished rentals are, are going to go up 
uh, especially in in locations like Palermo, et cetera. There's just too much demand uh, right now, and okay, I don't so think more demand oh, from Mille. Yeah, and uh, that yeah, exactly. Yeah, but They're, you think that basically will be flat for cost of living? Like if someone, let's just say they had their rent locked in or whatever, mm -hmm. um, everything else flat, more or less. Yeah, That's more or less. Yeah, a little bit, uh, a little bit of an increase because in all my time here in the, the twenty almost twenty years, I've never seen. Buenos Aires this cheap, like it's really, really cheap. You can, you know, in a, in a neighborhood restaurant, you can have a steak for like seven or eight bucks. I mean, it's, it's always been around, you know, $12 normally. So I think it's going to move back to, you know, uh, 10, 12 in, in neighborhood, uh, restaurants in, uh, in really touristy places. It's, it's a lot more expensive. Uh, but I think those prices will, uh, more or less, uh, stay the same. Um, but overall, yeah, there is going to be an increase, uh, just because of demand. Um, uh, and I see a lot of people coming here uh, or wanting to come here or invest, et cetera. Now that Millet is one, uh, they, you know, Definitely. it's funny how that works. It's not like everybody says it's not going to be a change from today to tomorrow, but, mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely interest. Yeah. Yeah. I arrived in Argentina in 2019 so i've been here for a while and seen a lot of price price fluctuations and i would agree that it like i think uh earlier this year was some of the cheapest i'd ever seen it it definitely like ebbs and flows just depending on how the blue dollar moves because what you'll notice is like prices will hit really hard and have a pretty intense surge so there might be like a period of like a week or two where you're paying like 20% more for something than you were 30% more for something than you were. And then all of a sudden the blue dollar would just like shoot up, <laughs> um, you know, 50%. And during those times, like it's extremely cheap. Like when you have that kind of like week or two buffer, when the, when the dollar hits hard and then the peso is like, or prices, excuse me, are, are dragging. Um, it's really strange. And then also like just a, another note too, I think most people are probably going to, uh, be in like Buenos Aires and specifically in the top tier neighborhoods, you know, Palermo, Recoleta, uh, Belgrano, etc. It's important to note that like once you get out <laughs> of those neighborhoods and especially into like, you know, tier B cities, for example, it gets uh, quite a bit cheaper even. So it's like it's it's like pretty shocking to see, actually. Yeah, you, you can see it in the uh, in prices too. The the square meter prices in Palermo, Recoleta, like all these uh, more touristy neighborhoods, they're around three k uh, per square meter. And if you go outside of that uh, little bubble, it's it's already two k. So it's like a, a third cheaper uh, versus uh, those uh, really more expensive neighborhoods. And they can be adjacent neighborhoods like Villa Crespo or. Uh, or some of the other ones that are really close. You can, you know, five five blocks, you walk to Palermo and you, you're at the same plaza and uh, the prices are a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got a buddy living in uh, Mar del Plata and I just caught up with him over the past three days. He coming into town to see the, uh, what was it, Red Hot Chili Peppers? They were playing at yeah. a concert yeah, they were in, playing in the city. Week. Yeah. Yeah. So he reckons prices down in the beach, so just three hours away from the city for people who don't know. It's a little beach town. Uh, it's, a, it's a good city, Mar del Plata. I think there's a few hundred thousand people living in the city. He thinks prices are 50% cheaper down there than they are in the city, which is wild. Yeah, that's that's the case in most of the interior cities. It's just so much cheaper. Uh, also to rent. And the thing is, like, there's not always uh, enough accommodation. In Mar del Plata, yes, because it's a very, uh, you know, internal touristic city. Uh, but if you go to other cities, like the Airbnb offerings might not be what you, you'd expect for, you know, even like. Uh hey, guys, quick interruption to tell you about BitRefill. BitRefill is the best way to convert your crypto into gift card balances. These are gift cards that you can spend at Hotels.com, Airbnb, Nike, and many more. You may remember Joel Valenzuela, previous podcast guest. He's been living on crypto exclusively since 2015, and he's a big consumer of BitRefill. And so I asked Joel, I said, what do you like most about BitRefill? He said that he likes the instant delivery, the precise amount so that you don't have to juggle a lot of gift cards, and he loves the global selection. Nobody else has this much selection of gift cards, over 10,000 gift card options across hundreds of countries. Go to 
bitrefill.com to sign up. And you can also use the code MyLatinLife for 10% back off your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. Uh, 200, 300,000 uh, uh, inhabitant mm -hmm. cities. There just might not be enough or Airbnbs. Yeah, Mara. Yeah, Patagonia will be the exception of like being pretty expensive. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, both accommodation and like food, like everything's just more expensive than Patagonia. Yeah. Yeah, Where do you think Mendoza sits? Is Mendoza like more expensive, cheaper? Affordable. Yeah, I'd say affordable too. Cheaper uh, than Buenos Aires. So the, the very expensive place is Baridochen. Mm -hmm. Which is a, yeah. a what are the city. what are the most expensive and the cheapest cities in Argentina? Top three of each. Most expensive, I would say Barrio Parque. It's That's a city. The, no, no, but uh, city. No, yeah. it's cities. So have. not not barrio. So it'd be like Bariloche, maybe number one. Buenos Aires, number uh, okay. two. Okay, so city of Buenos Aires, city of Buenos Aires, Bariloche. Yeah, Cariloche Carilo. is probably. Uh, it's a beach okay. town, also uh, on the way to Mar del Plata. Okay. Yeah. And then the cheapest? Well, I guess that'll be like Salta and Hujuy. And yeah, I think Kuma the north. Stuff like that? Yeah. Anywhere in the north. north. Anywhere. Misiones. Yeah, Misiones is pretty cheap too. Like all those northern yes, provinces. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Formosa and all that yeah. stuff. The Corrientes. North, oh, yeah. Mar Mara the found, north is also very underrated. You find, like, yeah. Uh, it's awesome up there. Like, it's super cool. No one really, like, everyone thinks about Buenos Aires and Patagonia, but the north is, like, very underrated for tourism and hanging out. Like, it's, yeah, it's awesome. road trips there are, are so cool. You have the, When you say north, what do you mean, Martin? What do you like? The Iguazu waterfalls. Like, Jujuy province, um, like even Formosa, Corrientes, all of it is awesome. Uh, I really like the north. I haven't been to Misiones, so I don't, I can't speak on that, but. Uh, I think like around like San Juan, Salta, Jujuy, all of that's really, really cool. Cool landscape. Backtracking a little bit to something you said earlier, Mara, you surprised me. Uh, so if we're talking about this potential, you know, two year path to dollarization, let's say maybe we get it around 2025, I, I would have expected, you know, prices to rise maybe after we get the dollarization. Um, but I, am I correct? Were you saying you expect prices to rise from now? So even if we have like a two year period to dollarization, and we do see a significant inflation spike. Like I'm not sure if you say three or four hundred percent potentially. Do, yeah. do you still expect prices to like uh, to get more expensive leading into dollarization throughout this like two year window? Um, yeah, I do expect them to uh, to become a little bit more expensive. Yeah, but not like crazy. I, I'd, I'd say you know max twenty percent in dollar terms. Um, not a whole lot more um, just because I don't think uh, salaries or local salaries are going to pick up to that kind of inflation in dollar terms. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see how that uh, plays out. Fascinating for anyone who hasn't been to Argentina and they're listening to this, uh, you should definitely come check it out. Cheapest city uh, I found oh, in Latin America, super cheap. Like worst case scenario, steak goes from yeah. ten bucks. To <laughs> exactly, bucks. it's like still like a third still there. <laughs> or, or, or half. <laughs> yeah. Really yeah, I mean, even when I was there in 2020, you know, uh, an old fashioned at a bar was like two bucks, two fifty. It was like insanely cheap. Yeah. So, and that was when yeah. it was like 65, 75 pesos to the dollar. So even though it's more than 10 x. It's still like somehow, you know, 250 for a, a cocktail. I mean, and you don't even have to go to so, something that Argentina has. The food is really good almost no matter where you go, right? So you don't have to go to the most expensive coffee shop. You don't have to go to the most expensive steakhouse, you know. You can just walk around the city, find some, some like nice coffee shop that, you know, has some random plastic table and you're going to get an amazing coffee right uh, the same with food like you, you don't have to go to the expensive places you can ask mara he, he uploads yeah. pictures of yeah, i actually I enjoy like the body of ones better <laughs> just because they're more like you know familiar small <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I feel like that's anywhere in Latin America. That's a, yeah. that's definitely a theme. If they've got yeah. plastic chairs and like a, a broken speaker from 2002, it's <laughs> yeah, right. like Cumbia. <laughs> that, those are the best spots. Yeah, I, now I miss the botecos in, in Brazil. I mean, th- those are my favorite places on earth, I think. You know, those plastic chairs like uh, sitting on cachaça, <laughs> just so good. <laughs> That's cool. So I'm sure there's a lot of people listening to this because they're investigating for themselves. Should I go check out Argentina? Should I maybe move to Argentina? I've seen a huge uptick in interest in people uh, interested in residency or moving to Argentina. Um, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, maybe it's the time I buy a cabin in Bariloche or something like that. What are you guys' thoughts on that? Um, in terms of real estate, I do think we kind of hit the bottom uh, this year. Um, it's still, you know, it's 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 more expensive than in at least in Buenos Aires. In other parts of the uh, country, not so much. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, relatively expensive for a Latin American city um, to buy in. Uh, you know, desirable neighborhoods like Palermo, et cetera. You're looking at you know three thousand uh, dollars per square meter. Um, but you know, if you compare it to 2018, it did drop like 20% uh, or more. Uh, that was the peak. Uh, the previous peak uh, around Makati was uh, 2018, and then during COVID, it really crashed. Uh, a lot of people left the country, had to sell like in a hurry, etc. And uh, we can see it bottoming out in the last couple of months. So I do think that um, you know, it's it's definitely not going to go down from here, uh, no matter what happens. Even though we get like five five hundred percent inflation, etc., it doesn't really matter for properties because it's all savings that are allocated in those properties. And uh, most uh, people that have property, they don't really have the uh, urge to sell it anytime soon, unless you know there's uh, some kind of emergency. Uh, and they really want to leave the country now, like, you know, what you, you see in Venezuela. I don't think that kind of dynamic is at play right now. Right. Um, so, you know, I would say don't be in a hurry. There's enough time. There's enough on the market. You can just like uh, right now it's really a liquid. So whatever you buy, you can probably still uh, get a discount of, you know, 7, 10 percent. Uh, before it was about 20 percent because it was really not moving last year and the year before. Uh, but now things are moving, picking up a little bit more. Um, but you know, don't, don't be in a hurry. I think you still have time in the next year, year, two years to, to buy stuff. Um, nice thing is that everything is in dollars. So, uh, you, if you manage your property well in a nice neighborhood, it's like, you know, 8% return in dollars. Um, mm. and if you have a lot of bookings, you can come to like 10%. Uh, the thing is, you have to pay it all up front. That's the only downside because there's no mortgages. But that's also the upside because that's why property prices don't go down that much. Because uh, if they were tied to mortgages, like everybody would just default on their mortgage uh, under these kind of circumstances, and a lot of properties would hit the market. And Mara, I've I've been talking to a few um, migration investors over the last few weeks about Argentina specifically, obviously. And what they claim is the thing that will really bring back the Argentine economy is the mortgages. Does that happen? Do mortgages come back to Argentina when Argentina dollarizes? Or is that when the peso starts to n- not hyperinflate? What, what is the trigger when mortgages start to come back in Argentina? I think dollarizing because that's what happened in the 90s too. There's so many people that were able to buy a property that otherwise couldn't, even with like very, you know, um, uh, normal paying jobs. Um, And during the 90s, there was a lot of mortgages uh, uh, that came on the market just because they pegged one to one uh, to the dollar. Um, So many, uh, you know, middle class homes were able to buy a house during that period. Uh, so yeah, I think if credit can come back, that will definitely be a boom. And then you can, I think then you can see some crazy stuff in, in the real estate market here. If credit really comes back and we can really see some, uh, some, uh, prices spike a lot more. Cause I, I'm also, I think with everything that's going on in Europe, I think we're going to have an influx of Europeans again here. 
Because yeah. uh, I seriously, you know, it, sometimes I think about it. What if everything turns to shit here? I'm going to go back to Europe. Hell no. Like with war, <laughs> with war on the on the border, uh, you know, every, how everything is playing out with the uh, digital ID demographics that, you know, suck. Um, uh, the whole cultural issue with, uh, you know, the clash between sort of like the, the new immigrants and, uh, and people that were already there. Um, I carbon only see taxes. that, yeah, carbon taxes, all the climate commies. I really see that, you know, become worse and worse and worse. And uh, I spoke to a lot of Germans already that they're just fed up with it and they just want to buy land in Paraguay or, you know, wherever just to uh, be left alone, basically. Mm. So if I'm hearing that right, then Mara, uh, the Argentine property market could be set up for a, a pretty nice catalyst if we do see dollarization in, let's say, 2024, 2025. So for anyone holding on to some Bitcoin, you would know that the Bitcoin halving happens in 2024. And typically you see a pretty face melting rally in the 12 to 18 <laughs> months following the Bitcoin halving. So if you see a Bitcoin peak in you know 2025, that could nearly be the perfect time to trim some sats and buy some property in Argentina just before mortgages return. Am I reading into that right? Or yeah, that, well, that's that's actually how how I would do it. Yeah, that if if we get another phase uh, ripping rally, which uh, I do think is it's probably in the cards with the ETF. I'm not too sure if the halving uh, really has such an impact on that, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. If it does, then yeah, I'm definitely going to trim an apartment or something. <laughs> 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 To diversify. Yeah. I mean, even anywhere in Latin America, it's still hard to get a mortgage for yeah. for foreigners, though, at least. And e even for locals, like it's it's still expensive, you know. Um, so they, they are still largely cash markets in places like Mexico and Ecuador and things like that. Beyond real estate, what about, you know, a lot of people's normal concerns, like the day to day concerns about can my can my kid find a good school? Um, am I going to get a good doctor? Just like day-to-day -day life stuff in Argentina, what would you say to North Americans and Europeans who are thinking about making the move? Well, I'd say for both, uh, it's really uh, on par or better in terms of service. Uh, of course, if you need to do really complicated stuff like you know some kind of cancer treatment that only exists in the U.S. or, or in Europe, yeah, of course, then you're going to have to uh, do that there. But like the 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 main uh, medical treatment hospitals, private hospitals are very, very high quality. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've had both of my daughters in private clinics here. It's more like a hotel where, you know, everything is really luxurious. Like coming from the Netherlands, it's just like, you know, wow, because everything is sort of public in, in the Netherlands. You, you know, you only get one consult uh, per doctor. Everything takes uh, forever. Uh, there's uh, nothing works. So this was a really uh, nice uh, change because, uh, you know, here, if you're sick, you just call uh, the doctor and they just come to your home. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very luxurious for, uh, at least from my European perspective, and it doesn't cost anything. I mean, we're paying, I think, 300 bucks a month for the whole family of four, and uh, everything is included. I mean, uh, we've never, ever have to pay for anything. I think we could even do two facelifts or uh, aesthetic <laughs> surgeries per year if you wanted to. I was going to say, bro. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's a caveat for that, though. Like, right now, uh, we have yeah. some serious issues with imports. So a lot of medical supplies cannot get inside the country. Uh, and it's really bad up to the point that the medical association uh, did a, made an announcement that says if you get a heart attack, you're dead because we don't have the supplies to treat you. Uh, so again, with, with everything that Mara said, I, I completely agree. But I, I would just, yeah, just, just let me ask though. So, so that's a good counterbalance, um, you know, but um, what do you think just about the, the holistic picture of a North American family or a European family that wants to move to Argentina or the Southern Cone in general? What advice would you have to 
a family of four, let's say, with like young kids or just like the whole idea of moving to a new continent. Are they going to be able to integrate well? Um, is it good timing? Uh, things like that. Argentine culture is very welcoming to immigrants, especially white immigrants. Uh, I would advise that, yeah, it's... Yeah. It, it sounds bad, but, but it's reality, let's face it. Uh, I would say learn Spanish and get to know a little bit about yeah, the I've culture. Yeah, I've talked about this. Uh, I, I, I would like to ask Martin what his experience was. I've talked a little bit about yeah. this, um, and I think that I think it's an easier adjustment for Europeans to come to Argentina because the lifestyle is a little bit more like kind of what they're used to. I think it's a little bit harder for Americans uh, and North Americans to come to Argentina. Um, and I think the reason for that, like to to um, to your point about the import taxes and being difficult to just like get things, that's a real problem in Argentina. Like you, you really have to be willing to uh, I think in certain countries in LATAM, like you can kind of just live like a like in your little gringo bubble. Um, I'm thinking about Mexico. I'm thinking about you know Central America, Panama, et cetera. And I think in Argentina, it's a bit of a different story where like you really have to be able to adapt and get into the Argentine like lifestyle, culture, and like their products, everything if you want to make it here long term. Um, I think most expats, like Mara is a, a serious like exception, I think. I don't think most expats make it here long term, uh, but not what I've seen. I've seen most kind of leave after a couple of years. And I think a lot of that is just due to like, you know, you really have to fully commit um, to, to being like in the Argentine lifestyle and bubble and culture and everything if you want to make it here over the long term. That's, that's my opinion. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. It's a very yeah. overpowering culture. I mean, that's also my experience in terms of, uh, you know, friends from uh, that I've made here over the years. Like most of them, ex you know, a few exceptions have all left after, you know, sometimes four or five years or whatever. But they, uh, at a certain point, especially if they had work, local work here, then, you know, they, they just got fed up with it and, and decided to leave. <laughs> And you compare that to like a Mexico where I think you do see people that stay there for many, 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 many years uh, over the long term. Um, and I think it is just due to like, you know, they really cater, like Mexico is just, it's North America. They like seriously cater to like the American lifestyle. It's, you're not changing that much if you move from yeah. Texas to whatever, uh, Mexico City or whatever. You are you really are changing if you're moving to, to Buenos Aires in the Argentine lifestyle. Like it's a it's an adjustment for sure. And I think it's something that, like I mentioned, I think Europeans kind of can handle it a little bit better, um, just because it's more like similar to what they're used to. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's correct. Something that I can say for Americans, because I'm in America right now, the biggest change you're gonna notice if you go to Argentina is people do everything late uh, you have in, in this united states you have dinner at five six in argentina you can have dinner at midnight you know you go to a bar it's open until four five six in the morning you go to a nightclub you know people will party until the sun rises everything is done really late uh, if you're used to waking up early and going to bed early uh, having fun it's going to be kind of difficult uh, most social activities are done at night and again they are done very late in the Mara, uh, one, one thing i want to make sure that we get to and maybe vance this is your next question but i, I don't want to leave this call without talking about like residency and citizenship in argentina mm -hmm. because i bet a lot of people who are listening to this are wondering what is the path to residency how can i get residency how long until citizenship after that? How does this whole process work? So um, if you could like walk through that, that, I think that would be really helpful. 
Yeah, so uh, it's it's kind of funny in uh, Argentina, and I think Vance tweeted about this uh, as well the other day, is that uh, you can, as a non-medical sewer passport, uh, it takes you three years before you get permanent residency, but within two years, you can actually apply for citizenship. So uh, medical sewer passport holders, they get um, permanent residency after two years and all the other passports after three years. But before that happens, you can already, if you have enough ties to the country, you can already book an appointment with the judge and basically uh, convince him that you have enough ties, like it can be a property or, you know, if you had uh, a child here or, um, you know, you have work relationships, et cetera. Um, and, you know, technically they don't get uh, rejected. Or if you do, you can book, a, a, you know, try to book with another j- judge and, um, and it's one of the fastest routes to citizenship uh, in the world. Like it's only two years, uh, so it's kind of crazy. And and actually, it's in the constitution where it says like any inhabitant of Argentina after two years uh, has the uh, option to naturalize. Um, so what that ha- that means is that you don't even need to have a visa uh, for that to happen, which is kind of weird. Uh, but a lot of Russians, for example. And now with the conflict uh, war going on, they've come here, you know, either with a pregnant wife or, you know, had a baby here after a while. They don't even have a, uh, a visa, a residency visa. They just have the kid, wait it out for two years, then apply and they file and, and that's it. Um, or they buy a, buy a house and then they, they file. So um, it's becoming like very crowded. So uh, actually there's uh, some lawyers that are already advising like, yeah, if you can get a, um, um, an address outside of the city, that's probably going to be better because the courts are less congested because right now there's like a waiting line with all these people trying to file for mm. citizenship and it can take like quite a while Good longer. Intel. Yeah. Good Intel. Can we double down on a point there? Did you say that, you know, you're eligible after two years of inhabitants? Yes. If that's a word, but you can, begin your case before you hit two years you can hey everybody hey everybody quick break from the podcast to tell you about language blend the best new way to learn spanish language blend was co-founded by jake nomada friend of the podcast decade of experience in latin america and jake and his team they put everything into this program that they wish they had in terms of how to level up quickly with your Spanish language skills, because the faster that you can get conversationally fluent in Spanish, the better the experience that you're going to have in Latin America. So go to languageblend.com for more information. And apply before you hit the two year mark. Um, I think you can uh, apply. So the appointment is after the two year mark. Um, because uh, getting the appointment also takes a takes a month or uh, can take like two months, uh, but it has to be after those uh, two years. Yeah. Because I've maybe heard some whispers about people that because the the process takes like two years that they just apply very soon after arriving, mm-hmm. and then they expect it's going to take a year and a half to get seen by a judge. And they've just kind of like just jumped up in the line, and they they only they applied when they've only been there for a couple of months. Well, yeah, I've seen those. I've seen a couple of those cases too. And if you have a good enough case, you're just going to get the citizenship. I mean, that's just not a not a problem. Um, I mean, and and buying property is already a good enough reason. In in terms of the requirements. Mar, I don't know if you touched on that, but is it six months of physical presence per year in those two years? Yeah. And obviously economic ties, uh, but is there any investment required or anything like that? Um, So you can get residency on a couple of uh, different visas uh, that lead to permanent residency. One, the most popular one is probably the Rentista, which uh, you, you just have to show passive income. Uh, on paper, it's two thousand dollars, but in practice, it's more like seven hundred, eight hundred because of the blue rate difference. Um, and uh, you can you can basically uh, uh, deposit those pesos at the bank every single month, so you can you can technically rotate those. 
you know, it doesn't, they don't have to come in. So, <laughs> so just so people know that, uh, that can be done. Uh, so, uh, um, that's the most popular one. Then other ones are, uh, employment contracts. Uh, you know, you can, um, uh, of course that that's not such a popular option to start earning in pesos, but I mean, that's how, uh, how most, uh, people, uh, back in the day got it because the rentista wasn't that popular yet. Uh, there are some, you know, companies that sort of provide that, uh, that option and, uh, and you don't really have to be there all the time. They just pay your social, uh, uh, benefits, et cetera, uh, to the tax men and, and that's it. Um, and yes, you do have to physically be six months in the country. Uh, and that is actually checked by Migraciones in your passport. So, uh, if you haven't been in the country for at least six uh, months, you can, you can leave and, and come and as much times as you want, but you have to be those six months, uh, there for them to renew the, uh, temporary residency after a year. And then eventually, uh, after, uh, the third year, uh, give you a permanent residency. And then once you have permanent residency, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, you can just, you know, you, uh, stay as long or short as you like. Something important to say, I think my Latin life uh, tweeted about it a couple months ago. If you get Argentine citizenship, it's yeah, almost impossible I mean, to get rid of it. Yeah. So it, it's make sure that you're making the commitment. But we we've since we've since figured out because that the naturalized loss, citizens can renounce, but it is a process, right? You have to put a yeah. case before the judge and it's like a whole court thing. It's yeah. not like you just show up at the embassy and hand over the passport. So you it's not you can't instantly relinquish it, but it, it can be done. That's yeah, that's my latest understanding of it. Yeah, it, you basically have to sue the state, and it takes <laughs> it takes like a few years, and then you know you, you can get rid of it. So it's not that easy. Uh, but you know, at the same time, people always say like, "Oh yeah," but uh, then if they might do uh, citizenship uh, based taxation, then you know I, I, I don't want to pay taxes in Argentina, etc. I mean, the chances that any Latin American country or even any European country is able to enforce that are practically close to zero. Uh, France has looked into citizenship-based taxation and the costs to implement that were basically higher than what they would ever get out of it. Uh, because uh, it's not just know. like- Who's France, by the way? Uh, sorry? Oh, France the country? France you... the country, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. They, they were looking into it and uh, the, it just, the cost benefit was just not there because it's not like from you know today they can say like, hey, now we're going to uh, tax all of our citizens uh, no matter where they live. Uh, it's, they have to re-sign all the tax treaties that they have with all the countries. Uh, then in able to enforce it, they can't even enforce it because they don't have the bank control that the U.S. has. Uh, so, you know, uh, making sure that people pay those taxes is going to be even more expensive. Um, so in the end, they just decided not to. Um, and I think that's a good case for mo what's going to happen in most countries. Uh, probably if a country like France would go ahead uh, with something like that, you know, they, they would probably give more fines and whatever, maybe even jail time if you, if you don't comply with it. Uh, but, you know, in Argentina or Brazil, etc. I really think that would just be a little bit above Eritrea in terms of enforcement. You know, it's just not. <laughs> <laughs> they, they just they yeah. just can't do it. They they cannot do it to your most Argentine dollars. Yeah, yeah exactly. Are in Uruguay, uh, in just any random bank, you know. So it's literally next to us, next to the city. And they just they just call the bank, and the Uruguay bank says, "I don't know what you're talking about," and hangs, and that's it. And they can't just do anything. It's too. Expensive I mean, they can't even they can't even they uh, tax their citizens. Like Nobody imagine pays taxes here. It's like how are they going to do it internationally? It's impossible. Yeah, I've asked. <laughs> I have a thought. I have a thought though. How, how, I've, asked, I've asked. I've asked Argentines, uh, like in the city. They're, they like open up a bank account and they send themselves like dollars into their accounts or whatever at the blue rate. And I'm just like, aren't you worried like that someone's going to see this and tax this? And they're like, are you, are you joking? Like, 
I'm pretty sure the only <laughs> tax that gets paid is like if you have an actual job, if you have like an actual job in Argentina, they take the taxes like out of your out of your sueldo, like your income. So I think that's like the only yeah. taxes that are actually getting paid. Maybe proper, maybe property as well. Um, and then I've heard, I've also heard outside of Buenos Aires, the rules get even like more wild, wild west. Like I've heard like no one pays property taxes on their stuff outside of Buenos Aires, basically. I think the province of Buenos Aires is actually a little bit uh, more uh, of the enforcement uh, uh, kind of tax collector, but, but after the province of Buenos Aires, like Cordoba, uh, whatever. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. I don't think anyone's. <laughs> yeah. I don't think anyone's stressing about it. No. I think the rule of thumb is that unless you're like moving in and out, like ten grand per month, the bank is yeah, just that's not correct. Gonna do I mean, anything. it happened to me. Uh, I changed uh, accountants earlier this year in in January. Because I, I was kind of all over the place in the last couple of years and I paid some guy to like file zero for my company. Uh, but I wasn't really sure if he was actually doing anything for my personal taxes. So I decided to switch and uh, switch to uh, a very uh, you know good guy. And I knew that he was like a, a lot more detailed. And I asked him, so could you check my personal tax uh, situation? And he said, like, you haven't filed taxes in four years. <laughs> <laughs> What happened? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> so he said, like, this is actually a good thing because now we can sort of bump up the numbers and uh, you can actually have more savings. And uh, uh, yeah, so you can be very creative with, with those kind of things because there's seriously, if, you, if you're not like a big fish, nobody's, nobody cares at the uh, tax office here. Nobody gives a, gives a damn. Does... There's also a political question that we have to make. When Millet is in power and after he makes all the reforms, it is going to be as easy to just not pay taxes, right? Because the idea is that he's going to lower taxes, get rid of uh, regulations, but people would more people should start paying taxes. That's kind of the idea. Do you think, Mara, that it's going to be as easy maybe in five, six years um, as it is well, now? It's probably going to get, you know, I hope that it gets a little bit harder because right now it's just like a complete jungle out there. Um, and But that, if it's uh, explainable too because it's just there's too many taxes on top of each other layered and sometimes you pay stuff twice or, you know, three times. It just doesn't make any sense. So everybody tries to pay as little tax as possible. It's basically the Laffer curve. And I think once they get rid of a lot of those taxes yeah. then yes of course I, I, you know usually that's what you see you see you get actually collect more tax uh, than you did before because Millet has said that so currently in argentina almost half of, yeah. of the economy is under the table what we call economia negro uh, Millet has said multiple times that he wants to make that under the table economy turn it on the books right but he promises that of course they're going to have lower taxes a better, a better tax regime but that means that if they want to get rid of the under the table economy they will have to be more uh, you know eager to investigate and enforce yeah the yeah they're gonna have to enforce it a little bit better but also i think the incentives are there to actually you know, you don't have to create all these weird ass structures if uh, everything's just working. You know, right now everybody has like, you know, companies that are uh, sending ghost invoices and it's just a complete mess. And you, <laughs> I think all that's going to go away once you don't have to pay ridiculous amounts of, of taxes. Hmm. Getting away from taxes because I don't want people to get in trouble, but I think we've kind of drilled on yeah, none of this is tax advice by the way this is none just is like anecdotal advice. so so what, what's our thoughts like is argentina citizenship worth pursuing james you've been getting into this world the past year you uh i think you're still just american you need another one what are you thinking would you would you rock with argentina citizenship 
Yeah, I'm I'm the lonely I'm the lowly sole American, only one passport. But working working my way towards the second. Anyway, um I would consider it. I think my sights are set more on Mexico and Brazil. Uh, especially Brazil with the connection to Portugal and the EU passport. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously there are other ways to get EU passports. If you're interested in Latin America through Spain, through your spouse Um, and then birthright citizenship in Mexico and Brazil, Argentina is up there for me. I just love the lifestyle there. So I would consider it, but I think those are the things that you should be considering when you're thinking about Argentine citizenship. Um, it's it's such a promising country in my eyes that it's it's such a beautiful culture, beautiful architecture, beautiful food and, and culture surrounding food. It would be interesting to be a bigger piece of that and diversify the nationality stack with an Argentine citizenship. That's just my two cents. Yeah, I think uh, also, uh, you know, uh, most listeners would probably know this, but uh, by now. Uh, but, you know, the uh, Brazilian and the Argentine passport and a lot of the South American passports, they give residency rights in most of the other countries. So that's a huge plus. If you have a European passport and a medical sewer passport, uh, it really broadens the spectrum a lot. And then I think Brazil has the additional benefit of, like you said, the Portuguese speaking countries, um, you know, they have residency rights there, too, uh, or very easy uh, uh, to get like, um, uh, temporary residency right away uh, with that passport. So that's, uh, that's definitely one I would consider as well. Interesting. Yeah. I'm on the fence. I'm on the fence. I think if anyone just needs a second passport, this is one of your, your fastest options in the world for sure. And it's not a, it's not that bad one, really all things considered at all really has a lot going for it. Yeah. And I, I think that's kind of paradoxical. Um, I think such a, like a country like Argentina that could be a economic powerhouse that used to be an economic powerhouse that has such a strong culture and strong cultural pull from around the world to get, to be able to get citizenship in two years is I think pretty crazy, at least in, in Latin America. Yeah. Yeah. It's a strong passport. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm in the same boat as you, James. Uh, sole Australian passport, and the government came out this year and started talking about uh, the potential of citizenship-based uh, taxation yeah. for Australians. So, like, I'm seriously considering Argentinian passport, and then maybe you know popping a baby out in Brazil next year, trying to work my way towards getting that uh, Brazilian passport. So, Brazilian, Argentinian—they look like the easiest ones to me. Uh, I haven't looked into Mexico much, but. Yeah, they're the ones I'm seriously looking at. I think Mexico uh, with a baby, it's also one year, right? Or is it longer? 18 months. 18 months, okay. The only issue I've got is, believe it or not, uh, my Salvadorian girlfriend can't get into Mexico, even though the countries are nearly neighboring each other. She needs wow. a visa to get into Mexico. Uh, but she can get into Brazil and Argentina. Yeah. Uh. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, yeah, if you want I to have... come up to Mexico and party with me, leave the girlfriend behind. <laughs> Vamos. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be right. Luke, I have I have some of those same issues because I'm uh, my girlfriend's Colombian and she can't obviously enter the United States. The, yep. the visa waiting period is about two years just to get an appointment when they're going to wow. 70% chance of getting rejected. Yeah. So... It, it's tough to, to date someone with a kind of a weak passport. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a real struggle. I've had to turn down so many opportunities because most of my work's uh, in America. Um, so, yeah. And how about Europe? How does uh, your girlfriend go uh, getting into Europe? Is she okay there? Yep, she's fine. And, and she also has EU access. Yeah, oh, that's but that's cool. Colombia for anybody listening. Yeah, every, every country, every Latin American passport has EU access, except I think Ecuador and maybe one other. Mm. Yeah, but it's just the US Canada thing is tough. And I guess Mexico for a couple of them, like Brazil, they took away EU or they took away Mexico access for Brazilians, for example. 
That's um, such a weird move. I just don't get it. Yeah. I think I misspoke one. just a second ago, by the way. Columbia has EU access. They've had that for a while. Yeah. They just got no, you said UK, it right. UK access. They just got oh, they, they don't have UK. They don't have UK. They just got it like like a year ago. Oh, they got it. Okay, good. Columbia now has UK access. Yep. Yeah, dude. So did you apply for the visa for the US 10-year tourist visa for your girlfriend yet? Like, yep. Like um, you got an appointment. It's just in we, 2025. <laughs> we applied in March of 23. Uh, funny enough, when we were in uh, Argentina, and her appointment is not until May of 25. Oof. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Uh, there's a little trick. So I learned it by experience. Every night at midnight, like exactly 000, zero, zero, zero uh, the, M the U.S. Embassy will update their database, and there's a lot of people that will can cancel their appointments. So if you're willing to check mm -hmm. every single night like I did, you can find oh, a shit. way, way earlier appointment. I started, so I applied for my visa on like July last year. Uh, and my appointment was in 2025. In one month of trying, I got it in December. So six That's months. That's huge. Would that be Eastern years. time? Because yeah. it's like, yeah, would it be Eastern time? Yeah. Uh, no, it, like midnight no, Eastern time. time. It would be. I think it's probably a local database, so it's it's yeah. So it's on uh, midnight wherever yeah, the embassy database, is. Yeah. Wherever the embassy. Oh, because it's the embassy website. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, so it would okay, be gotcha. Buenos Aires gotcha, gotcha. time. So. Damn. Okay. It's good in insider info. Mm. There, there's actually some people. That have made <laughs> bots. See, my <laughs> lawyer, my lawyer said he was going to do a bot or something. It just never happened. I don't even know. Or he said he had a bot, but yeah. So it's actually hard because there's all you have to compete <laughs> with the bots to get an early well, appointment sometimes. <laughs> but but yeah, if you try hard enough, you can in one month, maybe two months, you can get it way way Interesting. Early. Yeah, so I think a lot of listeners here are going to have their girlfriends staying up past midnight uh, for the next couple months. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm almost thinking like what's, what's interesting is the Argentine passport has the lowest – we've talked about this on Twitter, Mara, how the Argentine passport has the world's lowest – denial rate for us tourist visas or in other words has the highest acceptance rate like 93 yeah. percent, something like that and we've given some theories as to why that is but it's kind of it's kind of crazy yeah i think overall the argentines in general are if they have a return ticket they're just not that prone to actually go and live somewhere else they <laughs> it, it really has to uh you know be absolutely devastating for for people to leave And it's usually, you know, younger people leaving for Europe because they already have a second passport and they can live in Europe without any issues uh, versus, you know, uh, trying it in the States. Um, so that's just it's just less common. I think that's one of the reasons why the acceptance rate is so high. Um, yeah. Most people just don't have the resources to stay. No, but I mean, other other countries uh, have the same issue and then they do get rejected because they think even though they ha don't have the resources, they will overstay their visa and just like become illegal in the States. Yeah, it's an Mara, interesting fun fact. Yeah. Mara, I, I, when I was in Buenos Aires, I got to know a lot of the local people. Um, my brother had spent a lot of time there when he was younger and I got to know a lot of his friends and like the family he stayed with, all this kind of stuff. And they, a lot of people seemed like desperate and sad and, and miserable because of the situation going on, but nobody ever mentioned wanting to leave. Do you have like numbers to back up your, your claim that, and I believe you, your claim that like people just don't leave no matter the situation, no matter the circumstances, Argentine's Love well, I mean, I mean, they, they definitely leave. Uh, and, and in the last four years, I think it's uh, it has been record numbers. But I haven't seen the numbers after 2021 because uh, they uh, 
they just uh, didn't uh, report on them anymore. Uh, but no, there's definitely been a, an exodus, like a, pr a really important one, especially during COVID and after of a lot of people, you know, families uh, moving. Um, and, uh, but yeah, they, you know, it takes planning and uh, they're just not the, it's just not that common to just go on a plane with one suitcase and just stay there and see what happens. You know, that's just not uh, their style. I think it's not really that entrepreneurial or something. <laughs> Yeah, it's mostly it's mostly young people. I can speak from experience. Me and my friends, like we've been planning to leave for, I don't know, six years, like since we were teenagers. Uh, and I think most people who have like a college education uh, may be considering uh, getting out. Most people are probably not going to do it uh, because it's a huge risk. But the intention it's there, but 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 my ah, most people, uh, yeah, they don't really think about it. Maybe if they're really angry, they will say it, but they will never. I think do that's it. a that's a testament to how powerful the, the yeah. Argentine culture is and the stakes. For sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I really think so because you have to weigh a lot of things. Like even though you have almost you know two hundred percent hyperinflation. Uh, to get the same quality of, of life. Um, well, first of all, in other countries, you have to declare everything, <laughs> you know, and then uh, getting the same quality of life, you really have to, uh, you know, make uh, a very good income, etc. cetera. Um, so, yeah, it's not that easy to, uh, to give this up and then, you know, try your luck somewhere else. And the culture shock is... For some, it's really bad. I can speak for experience. Like, I'm in the states, and I just, you just cannot relate to anybody. What's the hardest it's part? Too different. Uh, <laughs> people really are just retarded. Like the Americans. And so, like, were we talking like yes. late twenties or something, uh, or thirties, mid to late twenties? The Americans mid are mid to late twenties. Yeah. What city? What, yeah, what city? What city? Uh, I'm on the suburbs of Pennsylvania, close to Philly. But it, it's really hard to relate. Something that it's so most people in Argentina do not drive, especially young people. Driving is a luxury, and there are some countries like the states that if you don't have a car, you just don't exist. And for me, that's been huge. And I think for most people that want to go get away from Argentina, that's like the thing that stops them the most because if you can move yeah, around, that, that's... You, can, you can do anything. So you have culture, you have language, you have driving problems. As Mara says, yeah, you, you would go to the United States thinking that you can do all the shady stuff that you do in Argentina, you're going to yeah. end up in jail. Like, now, walkable cities is, is definitely a... Uh... A luxury that I do not want yeah. to give away. That's why I wouldn't move to most parts in Brazil or the States. I think Brazil and the States are very similar in, in terms of needing a car for everything. You really need a car in Brazil in, in most areas, except maybe Rio, you know, in that small area. But, you know, even in Florianópolis or Sao Paulo, et cetera, you know, if you don't have a car, it's just really hard to, uh, you know, get out of the city and do something else. And, uh, public transportation is just not great. Um, and, you know, in the States too, I've never been there without a car. I've always, you know, you just need a car in the States. Well, thank you guys for all joining us on this uh, late night recording of the Argentina Roundtable. Thank you to Mara, James, Leviathan, Martin, Luke, Joe. Um, Really, really interesting, and uh, we'll have to do some more of these as we get more more progress uh, with, with Malay. You know, this is just the original burst of energy, so we'll see we'll see what what this is really going to look like in in twenty twenty four. But this is really fun just to catch up with a lot of the guys that we we talk to all the time on Twitter. So thanks for everyone for joining.